preocupado el presidente anaranjado Viendo que las elecciones las perdió Solicita a los que le hacen los mandados Que se apuren pues la fiesta terminó Y mirando que se va a acabar el varo Han formado un titingo Se han negado a abandonar la Casa Blanca A la silla del despacho se amarró Los pelitos que le quedan los arranca Bataleando por la rabia que le dio y mirando a Cuba con sus patas blancas, de cabeza se tiró. El que tenga confusión que se confunda, el que quiera claridad que venga a ver. La jugada no es compleja ni profunda, está claro cómo quieren proceder. Son lo falta que nosotros los dejemos, y eso no va a suceder. Con la conga de los hoyos no te metas No te metas, no te metas Cuba viva sin que nadie la someta No te metas, no te metas uh, Mi tierra linda, mi cubanía Mi bandera se respeta No te metas, no te metas De La Habana pa' Santiago Defiende lo tuyo cubano Que no te metas con mi tierra, que mi Cuba se respeta. Se respeta, se respeta. Soy el mambi que aún vive con el machete en la mano. Se respeta, se respeta. No, 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 no. ¿Qué me importa si comentas? No te metas, no te metas. ¿Y dónde vengo yo? Estamos listos para. Tiene miedo, tú conmigo no te metas. No te metas, no te metas. Hey. Oye, eso que todo mi alegría te molesta. No te metas, no te metas. Porque tú me conoces bien en toda mi faceta. No te metas, no te metas. Que no tenemos miedo, sal de ahí, no abras la gaveta. No te metas, no te Hello, greetings everyone. I'm Monica with the African People's Revolutionary Party. This is Onye Savu, my comrade. You have just tuned in to Pan-African Weekly News that we do every Thursday um, at noon. Um, we've been doing it since the pandemic, so for a little over a year now. And before we get started, we do a few things. One is we talk about who we are. So the All-African um, People's Revolutionary Party is a Pan-African organization um, focused on the total and liberation of all of, of Africa under a unified socialist Africa. So that means no matter where you are, um, if you're in this country, if you're in the Caribbean, wherever you are, if you're African, organizing to unify our people and liberate our people wherever we are, because no matter where we are, we're oppressed. And we know when Africa is free, we all will be free. The other thing that we also do is we call in an ancestor. And so for today's ancestor, we're calling in Harriet Tubman because on June 1st, 
is um, 1863 is the anniversary of the Com Combate River Raid that was led by Harriet Tubman. And so oftentimes people know Harriet Tubman for um, her leadership in the Underground Railroad. And what they don't also talk about is the military mastermind that she was. And so she led, um, she was in, uh, she volunteered in the, um, well, she served in the Union Army as an abolitionist fighting to free our people. And for the raid, what they were able to do is they had three ships and she guided all the ships by memory um, through rivers um, to free our people where the plantation was torched, houses were burnt, the livestock was taken, the, um, also the food that was there were taken. There were the, the majority of, and the, the most important thing that happened was freeing our people. So 750 of our people were freed that day. Um, people um, still talk about the raid. It's what's interesting about the raid is depending on, if you read it, his, the history perspective is they don't mention Harriet Tubman, but if you read it from our history, Harriet Tubman is mentioned. Um, also, Harriet Tubman is known as Moses. She was, again, a master military mind. Because the raid was so successful, in all future uh, similar operations, they used her same tactic. And what's interesting is she was not paid for this mission. It, she petitioned for it. And she was the first woman to lead in the army, but she was not paid because women could not lead in the army. So it's really interesting that <laughs> her brilliance led to continued more successful missions um, in, the, in the union. Um, let's see if there's anything else that's important about this. Um, she did petition to be compensated. And although she wasn't compensated, when she got married to somebody <laughs> through marriage, she was able to get a pension. Um, but again, master military uh, mind, saving our people, uh, leading our people to freedom. And there were over 300 people involved in that raid and 150 of them were African. And so she was leading militaries, um, freeing our people. So we appreciate you, Harriet Tubman. We call you in, we thank you for your brilliance. We thank you for um, showing us that we can fight for our people, showing us the importance of being revolutionaries um, and being abolitionists. The other thing that we do is we um, do a land acknowledgement. And when we do the land acknowledgement, what we, we are in Tiwa territory, so that's where we're in, so-called Albuquerque. Um, it is stolen land. Um, we believe in um, no matter how long something was stolen, it needs to be given back. So um, Palestine's land needs to be given back. Uh, Tewa territory needs to be given back. This is Turtle Island. It belongs to indigenous people. Africa needs to be given back. It belongs to the African people. And so no matter um, where we are, we are in solidarity with our indigenous people fighting for their land back as well. Um, Later on on the show, the show is special, has a special guest. Um, Onya Sabu will be introducing our guests on the show. So the topic um, that we're going to be talking about is um, about um, an organizer's perspective on a variety of different topics on abolition, as well as uh, involvement in the African str liberation struggle. That's going to be the topic for today. So glad you're here. I'm going to do a quick report out on our world geo topic. So last this past Sunday, what we saw is millions across the country, as well as Cuba and um, a worldwide doing a caravan solidarity event. And what the caravan solidarity events is significant for is being in solidarity with Cuba, who has uh, a blockade and the blockade um, has sanctions and the sanctions provide um, so many challenges, especially economic challenges on people, the people of Cuba accessing resources. And so in uh, Tiwa territory, the Los Versimos Brigade 
um, led a car caravan that had over 25 people there. We received political education, learning the importance of why this blockade must end. Um, we also learned about the demands that are in existence. And one of the demands is for people to contact Biden to abstain from voting um, on the blockade against uh, Cuba. And um, we did a caravan. We caravaned from uh, San Mateo and Central, that's like Walmart, all the way downtown and back. And so many people in the, um, who are walking um, were also screaming, free Cuba. Uh, so many cars were honking. We also had uh, messages on our cars. Um, my son was waving the Cuba flag and learning about political education as well in Cuba and was gifted a hat representing Cuba as well. And it was just beautiful. So many people, even cars were joining in, honking their horns as well. Um, so it was really beautiful caravan. Um, and there will be another caravan coming up on June 20th. And the vote happens on June 23rd. And so I just really appreciate um, being in that space with community, um, calling for the end of sanctions that have been there for over six decades, so over 60 years against Cuba, when Cuba has contributed so much and so, um, to medicine, um, so much to have uh, whatever they develop, they want to gift to the world. And the blockade provides challenges in making sure that happens. Um, so they have medicine that could help us, medicine that could help people worldwide, and the blockade prevents that. So wanting to share that update, um, I know, Oye Sabu, you're part of the Los Vecinos Brigade, and not if, seeing if you want to share anything else. I think you did a really beautiful recap. It was a very good day, seeing all those Cuban flags, and also seeing, like you said, just like random people eating on Central, walking on Central, being like, yeah, like really excited. I was like, why is Cuba so popular in Tiwa territory? It's because people in Tiwa territory understand that Cuba is not our enemy. Cuba is not a dictatorship. Cuba is not a country we should fear. It's certainly not a sponsor of terrorism like the Trump administration called. It's just a country that like liberated itself and now dedicates its time to helping humanity and the planet. So it was just really awesome to be out there with people for Cuba and also to see the like the really positive response that people had to us being out there. And I'm really excited for the next caravan, car caravan on the 23rd. Thank you so much, Anya Sabu. I am going to turn it over to you now to introduce our interview today. I'm so excited. So much knowledge is going to be shared in this space. Agree. Um, so yeah, we do the political education section every single week on the show. This week, we have a very awesome guest, someone who I respect a lot, someone who I work with quite a bit. Uh, that is Erica Keynes. I'm going to list Erica's bio. You're going to see how much this woman actually does. So Erica is an editor with Hood Communist. She is on the coordinating committee of Black Alliance for Peace, which is a really dope anti-imperialist African organization, actually a coalition. She is a member of the Ojima People's Progress Party, and she gives free radical and revolutionary books to African children through her organization, Liberation Through Reading. Welcome, Erica. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I love the weekly uh, news special. I always try to tune in uh, live, either on Facebook or YouTube. So I really am thankful to be here. Yeah, we're really glad you're here. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. So um, we have a series of questions for you, as we usually mm -hmm. do with our guests. The first question is, who is Erica Keynes and how did you come into the struggle? Okay, um, so I am a mom first. Uh, I know I usually don't, that's never my bio, but yes, I'm a mom. <laughs> uh, you know, I am an organizer. Um, I am a daughter. I am a, a sister. I am a great friend. <laughs> I'm a comrade to a lot of dope people, but more importantly, I'm a person that um, decided a few years ago to really, really commit myself to um, the liberation of our people by any means. So I found certain avenues before finding an organization um, to sort of participate, but I think that I've gotten the most uh, out of what I can do 
through being in organizations. Right. And in terms of like ideology and like praxis, I know you're a Marxist Leninist and I know you're an mm -hmm. abolitionist. And so I want to know if you want to talk a little bit more about why. Yeah, when I saw that question, I was like, oh, okay, because nobody really ever asked me <laughs> about Marxist Leninism. Like, that's never a question I'm ever asked. So, so I'll be happy to like break it down, especially since um, it's a little bit of a tax going on on my, my ideology. But, um, <laughs> but no, um, in all seriousness, though, um, so Marxist and Leninism basically. Um, so we understand that Karl Marx achieved a, a specific um, mythology that just could speak to um, the modes of production, right? And it defined how the aspect of society is dependent upon mode of production. Um, and that's what capitalism relies on. And then Lenin, of course, advances that by interjecting um, into, um, excuse me, imperialism um, making it clear that imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism. So what Marxism Leninism has done for me is just basically taught me how to understand and basically um, analytically and critically uh, articulate and deconstruct shit, basically. <laughs> um, but I also draw heavily on Pan-Africanism um, because I am African and also um, abolition like you spoke to and abolition for me it speaks to um just the need to tear down and reconstruct um the society outside of the strongholds of this colonial and imperialist construct so i i understand marxism leninism abolition and pan-africanism as working together uh, because i understand marxism leninism as a science that needs to be uh, applied to my material um my material surroundings. Word, yeah, and you're absolutely right. People tend to <laughs> uh, attempt to dunk on Marxism and Leninism all the time, particularly on Twitter, particularly in spaces <laughs> known as like a left book. But one thing that has to be perfectly clear, and I am not a Marxist Leninist, I am an extremist race, but one thing that has to be perfectly clear is if you look at the revolutionary struggles in non-European countries throughout the 60s and 70s and 80s, you're going to find a lot of Marxist Leninists who successfully wage anti-colonial socialist struggles against imperialism. Cuba, mm -hmm. like Fidel Castro straight up said, this is a Marxist, this is a Marxist Leninist revolution. But like, like I said, I'm not a Marxist Leninist, but I also have to recognize the very clear history of how that ideology has been used as a strategy to liberate colonized peoples, including African peoples. So. Yeah. Right, like Grenada and um, and like in Mozambique. Yep. So yeah, we were gonna put some respect our Marxism and Leninism on this show. <laughs> Next <Yes>. question. <laughs> shout out to the tankies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the other thing I want to say. Like, I used to be very skeptical of the organizations that people call like tanky, and then mm -hmm. I went to Cuba, and then I went to Venezuela, and let me tell y'all, the organizations that get shit on the internet are making like ties, like building relationships with those governments, with the people in those nations. Like you go to an anti imperialist mm -hmm. conference and they are there. They have the correct line oftentimes yes. on countries being attacked by imperialism. And it's very hard for me to believe that the attacks they get are not a function themselves of imperialism, that people are trying to discredit right. the organizations that are actually aligning themselves with the oppressed people of the world. So, yeah. Right, because they have a particular, especially in the global south, you see it, um, they have a particular sophistication about their organization. Like they understand far more clearly than we do. And I, and I do think that's a credit to the ideology um, because it forces that sort of analytical and, and critical analysis of historical, um, you know, dialectism. So, yeah. <laughs> no word. Thank you so much. Thank you both for that. Yeah, anytime somebody is doing a critique, we have to definitely investigate who's giving that critique. Yeah, and what um, have they actually done? <laughs> the, the next question we have for you is what is identity reductionism and what does it have to do with the struggle of African people against capitalism? Right, so I think I think before I can even discuss identity reductionism, I wanna ground it first in, in what identity politics actually is. So I just wanna read a bit from the Kabahi River Collective. Um, they say, in the process of conscious consciousness raising, actually, 
life sharing, we began to recognize the commonality of our experiences and from the sharing and growing consciousness to build a politics that will change our lives and inevitably end our oppression. We realized the, the only people who care enough about us to work consistently for our liberation are us. Our politics evolve from a healthy love for ourselves, our sisters and our community, which allows us to continue our struggle and work. This focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. We believe that the most profound and potentially most radical politics come directly out of our own identity, as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. So that's just some, that's just part of what they say in their um, collective statement. But identity politics is valid. And there's been a lot of attacks on identity politics because of the ways that it's been weaponized. And we see that in, in cases like the CIA commercial recently. But identity politics as a framework is valid. But then also identity politics as a framework has a reactionary and a revolutionary aspect to it. But what we are actually seeing is that reactionary aspect, which I like to refer to as identity reductionism, where people are, are be reduced solely to their identity. And a large part of that um, comes out of um, a misuse of intersectionality that is framed void of any ideology, right? So it, that could just mean anything to anyone and it could be anything to anyone because it doesn't have any political or ideo ideological framework. Um, so that's what we're seeing happening with identity reductionism. So it doesn't matter that Lori Lightfoot is like, you know, pro-fascist police, you know, anti-worker because she's a black woman, she's LGBTQ, you know, so she has all of these identities that they stack up to avoid actually critically looking at the actual politics that exist that are hurting black women, LGBTQ of her community, of that state, of that city. Thank you so much for breaking that down. That's so important. Um, no matter if people look like us, like what are what are their actions? You know, what are their actions? And so, I like the way you put about it around how it's been weaponized against us mm -hmm. um, so much. Like we've been seeing it, and it's like prior to Biden being elected and after. And I know it's been used as a tactic for. Um, generations even before that I just see it like so clear <laughs> in the past you know um, few years it was used under the Obama administration right um, it's used for many 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 things yeah mm -hmm. uh, so go ahead on your civil I was just gonna say like you know there's the example of Marilyn Mosby who I've learned all about thanks to the organization <laughs> organizing, organizing of Erica and the free key thieves campaign there's like people like Kamala Harris there's people like the Obamas themselves you know, like there's this people like invoke um, racial identity or gender identity or sexuality or like a combination of those things to say this, pe this person is for us and we should celebrate them in this position regardless of what they're doing. Or right. we should excuse the clearly sell out stuff they do because of their intersections. So like, yeah, it's right. just very, it's very right. Cool. And I think that the, it gets more complicated because, you know, oftentimes because they are like mainstream figures, they are getting attacks from the right, right? So then that puts you in the position to have to decide if you're going to be raised first. But I think if you have a clear understanding of identity reductionism, you don't even put yourself in that field to battle it out, right? You know, <laughs> because that's not, neither neither one of them have your best interest, not the right wingers or the people who's abusing identity politics for their benefit that's, that oppose the same structure that gives way to these right wingers and these fascists. Yeah, I agree. You know. It sounds good. I'm rooting for everyone black, but not everybody <laughs> black and is rooting for us, <laughs> right. especially when we see an identity politics um, like you shared. So, and then we're questioned when we um, have a have a critical analysis about how no, they don't represent us, you know, and right. then we're told like, why are we being against our people? Right. So follow-up question for you, speaking of people like Marilyn Mosby, speaking of people like Kamala Harris, why do you think so many petty bourgeois African women are willing to play that mammy role for empire? And what does it mean for the masses of African women in general? Right. Um, it's beneficial. But but I, I, I do want to take a few steps back and just talk about the ways that we've all come into like frameworks like feminism and things like that, because I think that that has helped move 
the trajectory of a Marilyn Mosby and a Kamala Harris forward because there's some there's a lot of confusion about the framework itself or the ideology because of the ways that we come into it. So within the 10 years, we've seen these advancements of, you know, say her name and, uh, you know, protect black women and such because it's been a, a strong, uh, I don't want to say uh, revision or revisiting, but we have been reintroduced to a lot of uh, feminist women like Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde in the last 10 years through avenues like Tumblr and Twitter. Um, but then also through those avenues where we're being introduced to these women, they're like sort of being gay cut, right? Because we're being introduced to Audre Lorde, but separate from Kabahi River Collective. Mm -hmm. Like we're not being introduced to Audre Lorde in her anti-imperialism, but we're being introduced to Audre Lorde in her antagonisms towards Black men. Or, you know, that's how we've been introduced to Bell Hooks, you know? Similarly, like we can quote white capitalist patriarchy, you know, colonial imperialist systems, like she always says, but nobody has ever taken the time to be like, well, what is a white supremacy capitalist? But we know that word for word. And I think that having been introduced to these women who have these sort of politics in that way has allowed for the misuse of intersectionality, has allowed for identity reductionism because we've only been you, we've only been introduced to one facet of these people. So when we see a Marilyn Mosby or we see a Kamala Harris, we start to um, think back to the writings of the women or the, or the writings that we've been introduced to or allowed to been allowed to be introduced to that speaks to the antagonism that speaks to. Um, that triple oppression without naming it, right? So now Mosby and Akamla looks like a come up for black women who have struggled all these years and who have, you know, always played second or always, or never got a just do, or were never named when we talk about, you know, how many people talk about Kwame Ture, but don't talk about Ella Baker, yeah. you know? So these are valid criticisms, but again, things that are, you know, useful to people who make use of them. So they're not talking about Ella Baker as, as to say that she needs to be amplified for her, for her work, but more so she needs to be amplified over all of these men because it's too much men, right? No focus on the work. And I think that that's what we're seeing. Like we, there is a promotion of black women um, in that way. But then also I think that a lot of people have already caught on to the Obama thing that that light is kind of dimming. So why not? throw a black woman in. Let's see what we can get in this mix. And if the black woman like them, well, let's try a little Latina, you know, because that's that's the direction that they're going to go. Like, you know, they're going to get more and more counter-revolutionary as they need because the empire is trying to save itself. So that's the position that Kamala Harris is playing now or Stacey Abrams or uh, Mayor Bowser. That's the position that these black women are upholding and they are willingly upholding these positions. Um, which is which is more of the issue, right? Yeah. Um, because I don't think that any of them are going into these spaces not knowing because they use that, right? They use that sort of, you know, this we got to work twice as hard and, you know, we got to show up and we can't be out here wearing our bonnets, you know, like <laughs> we got to be real professional and on top of shit. So they understand that there's a certain level that of, of pushback they're going to get for being in these spaces. So they use that to try to make that like the everyday working person's issue, but they have no problem dealing with those things. Their issue is that we as working class people are not doing our part to uphold what blackness should look like so that they, to make their jobs easier. Mm. Can you say more about that last part about upholding what blackness should look like to make their jobs easier? Yeah, I was listening to um, uh, Dr. Ball and Two Black talk about the pound cake speech, right? And mm -hmm. like uh, Bill Cosby. And essentially they, they were just basically saying like, the issue is not even so much that, you know, people out here getting shot over pound cake for Bill Cosby. It's that not only are niggas getting shot over pound cake, but now he has to try to wheel and deal and make deals with these white people who are looking at him as the nigga that was still pound cake. You know what I'm saying? And that's how a lot of these petty bourgeoisie women and, and men, uh, black men and women, approach working class people. Like, that's where the respectability politics is coming from. It's coming from that base of stop fucking up our money. Like, <laughs> you fucking yeah. shit up over here. <laughs> like, don't do that. Yeah. And like to the point of, you know, how these petty bourgeois African women like Stacey Abrams, like Marilyn Mosby, like Kamala Harris, like Michelle Obama, um, mm -hmm. how they're going into these spaces with full awareness of what they're actually doing and the role they're playing to like save the empire, basically. 
um, it makes me think of like, you know, like hashtag listen to black women, hashtag like protect black mm-hmm. women, hashtag say your name even to be honest with you, because the whole narrative that produced that hashtag is like questionable to me. But like, it just makes you think about how when people use, they say like black women in general, but they're talking about a particular subset of us. They're not talking about me. <laughs> they're not mm-hmm. talking about Erica. They're not talking about Monica. They're not saying listen to revolutionary socialists and pan-African as African women because if they were listening to us, we would be saying like fuck Marilyn Mosby, fuck mm-hmm. Kamala Harris, fuck Michelle Obama. They don't represent us. They're not saying listen to us. They're saying listen to these like striving, like opportunistic traitors, basically. Right. Basically, and they're using those hashtags and they're using that identity reductionism to create an opening for like, they're just like rank celloism. They're basically mm-hmm. saying this, what I'm doing is okay because I occupy this particular body. Right. Like for instance, Tim Scott, is that is that the congressman's name, I believe? He can come and say that America is not a racist nation, right? And Tiffany Cross was a pundit on MSNBC. She could do a whole special on that, right? She'd write articles on that, cussing Tim Scott out. Kamala Harris says it the next day and it's like, well, you know, she has a point. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Like no one pressed her. No one. No one. You know? And we we really have to question that. Because what does that even mean that Kamala Harris can come up here and say that America's not a a racist nation? And why is that? How is that so different from when he said it? You know, you see what I'm saying? So there there are particular dichotomies that are being played upon um, that people have to really be honest about. Like, I, I do want to talk, like, I just recently finished this book <laughs> that I'm really upset about. It was on the Grenada Revolution. It was on feminism, like a feminism take on the Grenada Revolution. Now, I when I talk about Marxism-Leninism, I want to credit Maurice Bishop, particularly because had I never been introduced to that man, I don't think that I would have understood Marxism-Leninism as being applicable in the way that he was able to apply it through that revolution and just reading his work and the ways that the Grenada Revolution had evolved in the time that it existed. Um, So I was so excited to hear a woman's perspective because I knew there were women in the party. I knew there were women who were high ranking members of the party, but I never did get to hear from him or I mean, hear from their perspectives. I did have hate to hear from Maurice Bishop, of course, Bernard Cord, of course, but nothing from a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, but this book was written by a literary scholar. So it's a, it's a feminist academic and she pretty much shits on revolution. She shitted on the grand revolution the entire, you know, as if to say that it wasn't something that um, the women were really 100% on board with, or if they weren't 100% on board with, you know, it was too violent. Revolution is far too violent. And like, just like, so that, so then, you know, I, I'm not an, I'm not a degreed person, but I really did start to, it's like, is this what the fuck is going on in schools? <laughs> <laughs> Is this what people are paying thousands of dollars so <laughs> somebody writes some nonsense like this? And I was like really, really upset because I'm thinking, had I not been introduced to the women of the PAIGC, or had I not, you know what I'm saying? Or had I not been introduced to the women of of the um who who carry out the, the Cuban Revolution even, um, I would have had a, a very, very different opinion about what it means to evoke violence or, or what violence looks like. You know what I'm saying? Because if, if you're under neo-colonial rule, like Renata was at that time, um, that's violence. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and then honestly, the Grenadian revolution wasn't even really violent. Like they just took, you know, it, in comparison, there was, there was no real bloodshed, you know, um, when we look at how revolutions took place. So for that to be the focus, um, and then to evoke like different generations of women who would have different aspects or different outlooks of that revolution. I was just really like, wow. So there is a thing happening that we need to like really be aware of and critical of and, and honest about, um, especially when we see black men push back against it, right? Um, we can't always look at that like it's just a reactionary thing. Especially because if it's black men in academia and I'm not an academic, I, I would assume that they would know, you know, full on. Um, but, but I can't not say that that's not happening. And a lot of these frameworks that disassociate anti-imperialist stances from these feminist women that we have come to know, um, strip them of their revolutionary aspects too, or shit a revolution, or even one of them comes to tell you that Marx was racist just because, you know, (laughs) they just tweeted out just because. Oh, wasn't that, wasn't that? Yeah. 
Feminista Jones. Mm -hmm. Just because. Woo! Just because it's Tuesday. Yes. Marcia's racist. Like, <laughs> but Elizabeth Warren, A OK. <laughs> Who pretended to be indigenous for like 40 years. OK. Like, that's not racist. But yeah, I feel like it really speaks to the class contradictions that exist even within African expressions of feminism. Like, right, right. now, we're being dominated by the petty bourgeois flavor of womanism or African feminism. Yeah. Well, Monica, you got the next question? Yeah. I'm just thinking about the, what Erica is saying. I don't want to take us off tangent. I was gonna, <laughs> I was thinking about a Facebook thread where, you know, I'm not going to take us off there, but I'm, I'm going to go to the question. <laughs> <laughs> we have time. I'll come back to it because it speaks to the, this discussion. Um, so the next question we have is, how do we fight African sellouts of all genders and identity uh, reduction, reductionism? With this, <laughs> like we do right here, right? If we're out organizing, out propagandize, um, then we gotta, we gotta uptick on our propaganda and and spread it and political education. I think that um, what you all are doing with the AAPRP and the multiple streams of, of propaganda that you have going on right now and Black Power Media as well. I think that th we're able to sort of poke holes in that mainstream narrative, um, especially when we talk about, um, like you keep mentioning Marilyn Mosby, right? Um, Marilyn Mosby is the Baltimore State's attorney and who has um, gotten away with the, the last six years with the persecution of this um, Black man, uh, Keith Davis Jr., like repeatedly trying him, repeatedly trying him, um, which puts her on par with uh, the racist state's attorney in uh, Mississippi who has tried Curtis Flowers for um, that, that same amount of times. Um, so Marilyn Mosby has skated by <laughs> because, you know, identity reductionism. And also because Marilyn Mosby is, she has national outlets, national mainstream outlets who can redress her. Like April Ryan is a black journalist, a black journalist from Maryland, a black journalist from Baltimore and would never ask her about Keith Davis Jr. She will, however, talk about Freddie Gray and April Ryan knows that she has a very, very national and a very, very public platform but she knows what to do with it. So what I'm saying is we can't entrust black media because they're black media. We, if we know that, you know, the same things that we're struggling with, which is these politicians and these petty blue politicians, we have to be fully aware that they, they take up all institutions, including our media. And I think that if we want to break barriers and have people understand clearly why people like Marilyn Mosby are our issue, why Kamala Harris continues to be an issue, especially geopolitically, especially in the role she plays now more than ever. Um, we have to consistently, you know, out-organize and have this type of propaganda that pushes back on it. And share, 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 you know, share her communist articles because I know I write plenty about this topic because <laughs> it's always on my mind. Um, it's a consistent thing that we see happening. Even with, um, like, I, I was joking about the bonnet shit, but, like, even when people talk about, well, they didn't discuss it without talking about Monique, ain't shit about Monique, but it's like, all right, well, we're not going to pretend <laughs> that Monique was always this pro-working class person when she was up against that fight. People were calling her millions of dollars pennies in comparison because people had no class analysis, right? Monique has decided to make her fight as a petty bougie woman for millions of dollars, every black woman's fight, because this is how they treat every single black woman. At the same time, you've never once fought for 15. You have never held a picket sign. You've never tweeted out. You've never even pushed your senator when it was on the floor just this January and now you're shitting on sitting on the same class of people that you needed to boycott Netflix because they're not staying at home with their bonnets mm -hmm. <laughs> they're walking outside you know what I'm saying they're walking outside now and so so yeah if we have to stay consistent because what she's doing now it would be no surprise to anyone if, if you understood that she never really gave a fuck about the word class anyway so why would she not make these comments um, you know, and also, like, I think we need it consistently because celebrity culture, like, it's a big ass network of, of media. It's celebrity, it's pundits, it's athletes. So if we're, you know, we don't have, we have no name, right? <laughs> then, so like, you know what I'm saying? So we really have to be the people to create those spaces. So like, you know, 
create your own sort of hood comedies, create your own Pan African Weekly News, and but join organizations and you know get that shit popping and consistently, consistently push back because that's the only way that we can at least penetrate, if not stop it. That's real. Yeah, I hundred percent agree, and I also feel like when it comes specifically to these. Petty bourgeois African women sellouts and the way they say, like if they are criticized for anything they do, like I remember Marilyn Mosby was like doing like a like a some kind of interview on a bike trail and someone rode rode by and said free Keith Davis and she like gave him the finger and then later on people were like, Girl, what the hell? And she was like, I felt unsafe. Like they they like weaponized, like they weaponized their identity. She did, she said it. They weaponized their identities to cover, like when Kamala, like people were calling out Kamala Harris's long record of like putting women in men's jails, of like uh, locking up moms, like single mothers, of like being a Zionist, of being an imperialist. That she was like, why am I being held to a different standard than this European man? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like they will literally like use their bodies as a shield. They will say like, you cannot call me on my obvious nonsense because I am an African woman. I am queer, I am this and I am that. And I feel like when it's petty bourgeois, African women doing that, like revolutionary African women, I'd be like, no, you're full of shit. <laughs> and like be uncompromising about it, like point it out and refuse to let the pie behind us like that. Yeah. I have an elder that tells me like, cause you know, he's a man, he's like, yeah, it's not gonna be us that's gonna catch the hell from these women. It's gonna be sisters like you and Onye and Sharice that's gonna be catching the hell because y'all are consistently towing the line against that. Like, no, no. And I am I am a womanist. I am a, you know, I do consider myself a black feminist. So I ha- it's not about black feminism. It's just understanding the duality of things, right? Everything has a revolutionary and a reactionary aspect. And you just really have to ask yourself, like Drew always says, what part of the bar well, you know, what side of the barricade are you on? And I think that that helps make things very clear. Um, yeah. Um, we actually have a question from the audience from Sally Fu. Hey Sally Fu, good comment. I like to ask, how can African hey, men <laughs> best assist African women and gender non-binary folks in pushing back against identity reduction? So how can they support us taking on these sellouts? Amplify our messaging. <laughs> For every every time you see one of them sellouts getting promoted, promote one of us. <laughs> like, you know, promote one of us. That's the best way. Because I don't think it... it, it serves any purpose for like for African men and women to be an anti anti um you know anti uh excuse me antagonistic that was so hard for me <laughs> you know struggles daily and I think that that is always what it kind of comes down to especially online um mm-hmm. especially with liberal black women who weaponize their black womanhood um that's a that's just an easy easy so you know just let let us handle it let the non-binary and the trans and the and the cis women handle the non-binary and the trans but just amplify us when you see it because you know it's not to say that you don't have a place specifically but especially online um it's it won't be productive yeah it's not a productive space to push back yeah it's like if you were to see women fighting or if you were to see like non-binary people fighting if you were a man to jump in that would be messed up but <laughs> let us fight yeah. and just like amplify, amplify. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, last question. Actually, there was something else I wanted to say about this particular topic, but I lost my train. Of- it's gone. Anyway, um, so last <laughs> question. <laughs> Why? It's kind of like a, a, it's related, but it's also related to like a larger conversation we've been having about the issue of narrow nationalism and people saying like the African, like Africans will have no allies and we don't need to worry about what anyone else is doing. We have to focus on ourselves and there's no need for solidarity. Um, but you, however, are in an anti-imperialist um, African coalition, Black Alliance for Peace. You are a Marxist Leninist, which means you're an internationalist. And so I wanted to know I from you, why is it important for the African liberation struggle to be anti-imperialist? Um. So like I get Dr. Clark's Africa has no friends, right? I get that in in theory, Um, but I just don't see that being reasonable if Africa exists within the rest of the world, right? You know, Africa does not exist outside of earth. (laughs) Um, So we are going to have to interact 
with other nations. Um, so whether that be strategically or, you know, um, um, materially, you know, we are going to have to interact. And I think the best way to push forward is, is, is struggling through that. I, because there are valid, there are valid things, right? There is anti-Blackness that exists. Um, but I also think that that's, that's a colonial question, right? I don't think that any, I don't think any of these things are innately who colonized people are. I think that's all part of the con the colonial process, right? Um, so yeah, so I don't see because I and, and also I as as someone who loves to read books and and a lot of these books has informed my ideology. I have never seen a successful revolution that did not involve internationalism um, or or some outside help or some sort of trading, you know, or how, who you get the weapons from, you know, what I'm <laughs> who you know. So strategically. If we want to do it as far as that, it that to me is why it's necessary because Africa is not going to be able to exist on its own. Like, because Africa does not exist, you know, it doesn't exist on its own. We are, we exist within a world. Um, so while it should be free, we should also understand it as a part of the world and not separate of, from it. And like the point about how we have had support in the African liberation struggle. Like whenever I hear that quote, like we have no friends, I'm like, and then also like during the <laughs> cycle, like first of all, Cuba was a friend is still a friend. Like it's not ambiguous. Like Cuba showed up for African and African people and it still is doing so. But like also, like we said, like, you know, uh, anti-colonial revolutionary struggles and organizations we're sending people to the USSR and China for training. We're buying weapons from the USSR. So like they, we were already working together, like the world socialist and anti-imperialist front and with great success. So like uh -huh. just it, the history does not support that position. And it also, no. like you said, does not make sense strategically. No. And then follow-up question is, I, I called you an internationalist, but like, what does that mean to you? What does it look like? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I said my internationalist because I think it's a softer way to say Marxist letter this way. <laughs> it's the more, <laughs> yeah, it's the more like people friendly way. But um, but yeah, it just means um, international forming international coalitions and and being involved in international struggles and understanding my position as a, a citizen within empire. Like I live within the U.S. empire, and I understand that what that means. The, the U.S. has military, like what over eight hundred military bases of, across the world. Um, so what does that mean for me here as a citizen and just understanding my position um, in solidarity with all these other struggles that exist because, um, if not because, but in part two, uh, you know, Western and U.S. hegemony and the spread of Western and U.S. hegemony and the attempts to spread it. Um, so that's why that's why I call myself an internationalist and that's why I consider myself an internationalist because I am deeply concerned and involved with international struggles as a person who lives within empire. And I feel like it's really important for people within the United States to understand what you're saying, that we live in like the most dangerous and expansive empire that has ever existed in history, that has military bases on every single landmass, that regularly overthrows governments and sanctions people and just like creates suffering around the world. That is what we pay our taxes to. So understanding that position, understanding the struggle as global, extremely important. Also, we have a few more minutes and I actually remember what I was gonna say. So you said that you consider yourself a feminist or a womanist, but you also do not have an antagonistic position towards African men. That sometimes does exist in like petty bourgeois manifestations of African men. I was wondering if you could speak more to that. Yeah. Uh, well, I've come a long way. <laughs> okay, I've come a long way. It's probably some people watching this like, she a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but no, I, I have come a long way. Um, but that's most that's mainly because I um I've had to have these struggles in real time, and that's a lot to do with organization. Um, being organizing with African men who do not share my ideology or my beliefs, and having to struggle through that and around that, um, just sort of helped me avoid. Uh, being antagonistic, and I was, and a lot of the reasons why I was antagonistic, and that's why I'm, I'm trying to be more introspective of the frameworks and how I've been introduced to them, and that's why I talk about Tumblr and Twitter being a, a home base for a lot of us, because it was um, 10 years ago, or within the last 10 years, um, 
But it always, I was always like, man, the black man, you, that's all y'all want to do. Y'all want to shut people down. And there was a time, there was honestly a time where, um, I want to say it was 2017 and a principal was murdered by her husband in California. Right. And there were a lot of black men online saying that, oh, this is just a random thing. This is not something that all black men are doing. And y'all are just trying to make all black men seem this way. And I took it upon myself to track how many interpersonal deaths were happening. And there were over 30 by the time July hit. Right. But then what I realized was all that did was leave me open for being attacked <laughs> by black men. It didn't solve anything. No one was receptive to it, you know? And it, it was just like, it was, and it, honestly, and it wasn't really done in good faith. You know, I was doing it to prove a point. Like y'all trying to make it seem like it's not a big deal and it is a big deal. And so I was never even able to like organize anything around that. It was just like, here's some stats of y'all killing us. See, y'all kill us. <laughs> and it was like nothing was useful about that. And I had to like really think about that, you know, because what, what do I want to accomplish? Am I trying to stop black women from being murdered or am I trying to win an argument with a black man? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and how, how do I make use of that? Like, how do I connect the two? How do I stop black women from um, being murdered, by, but bringing these black men that I'm struggling with? to understand that this is a real thing that's happening, but what can we do about it? And I think that reevaluating my position in that has helped me move from that and try to be more, I'm still as critical. I'm still not taking no shit, <laughs> but you know, but I'm not looking to always fight. You know what I'm saying? I'm not coming in, you know, with my fist up ready. And that's how I was approaching every, struggle with black men like oh i know he about to say some shit i'm ready like you know two feet planted <laughs> i know he about to start like you know so now i'm not i'm less guarded in that sense i'm more open to understanding and finding places where we can unite um and but mostly because i have to i have to now i you know and I, I don't i'm not in an organization by myself i don't organize by myself and i'm not looking to organize people like myself so I have to figure. I had to figure out a way to be less antagonistic, but that doesn't make me less feminist. It doesn't make me less womanist. That doesn't make me value black women less any less. Um, it doesn't make me value black men anymore. You know what I'm saying? It's not like a, there's a, now like promoting black men or now there's a hierarchy. It's just that I value black people, and I'm trying to see us all be free. And I don't want my child growing up to be that black man that's having these same struggles with a black woman. Like I want to be able that we at some point break this shit and we have to figure out if this isn't working, what else can we do? Yes, beautiful. I had a very <laughs> similar tip chapter where I started off being like, these people are fucking trash, like men are trash. <laughs> and then I was recruited to APRP and like, yeah, I was a, it's a multi-gender organization. So I was working with African men, like elder African men, people like Ajamu like recruited me into the APRP. And I remember being skeptical of that man for absolutely no reason for like a year. <laughs> like, I was just like waiting for him. And he just never did. He was like completely committed to anti-patriarchy, completely committed to showing up in the best possible way. And he was very open about the fact that he didn't start off with that level of understanding. He didn't start off with that behavior, but it was the process of becoming a revolutionary within the APRP that showed him the way to fight patriarchy on a day-to-day -day basis as a man. And like, he is far from the only, the man in the African All People's Revolutionary Party that like, has that mindset and that moves in that particular way. And once I saw that, I was like, and then I also developed an understanding of colonialism, but once I saw that it was possible for men to engage in this process of transformation and a revolution, I was like, what right do I have to say that this group of men is trash? Like, mm -hmm. men are trash discourse, especially in a world where African people in general are discarded and treated like trash. Like, to me, it makes no sense. Like, why Why would I call right. a brother trash if, like, capitalism calls him trash, colonialism calls him trash, imperialism calls him trash? You know what I'm saying? So I just had to, like, unlearn a lot of stuff, um, very similar to how you did. And it was, it was working side by side with revolutionary African men that did it. And then also developing an understanding of how the issues that we have interpersonally are not happening because we're like fundamentally bad people or because something's wrong with us, regardless of right. it's happening because we're colonized. 
is happening because, like, you know, colonization and capitalism use patriarchy as a divided conquer tactic. But we have to recognize that that's not something intrinsic to us that can be changed. It can be changed. And if you can like, condemn an entire gender, you're not going to change it. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, any um, last thoughts, Monica, or follow-up questions? I don't have any thoughts. I'm just soaking it all in. <laughs> um, turning it back to Erica. No, I just want to um, thank you all um, for giving me a chance to speak about Marxism and Leninism. Because, like I said, nobody, literally, nobody asks me <laughs> about it. And um, I, you know, I always say that I am. Um, Cause you know, I want to make sure people know we still out here. We still black. We still out here. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I do appreciate the space and the work that you all are doing in your perspective um, areas. And I do hope that we do get to work um, soon. Cause I know Operation Relentless Pursuit is still in your town, just like it's still in Baltimore. Um, so maybe we can link up and do something with that. But yeah, thank you all so much. Great. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for all the consistent work you do in so many spaces to liberate our people. I know that I've, I've learned quite a bit from you. And I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, echoing Oya Sabu. Thank you for everything. Hey, I don't know what you were talking about, Monica, with the Facebook thread. What was it? No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was I'm so I was thinking about a Facebook thread um, that was filled with um, men that were coming down upon um, you know a young person that's a woman that was shot. So I was reflecting shot and murdered by the police. So I was reflecting on what Erica was saying and also now even more so this thread. <laughs> so I think maybe we should do a show on it. But basically of that internalized oppression of like putting us against one another and how I had to think about how um, even though in that space it was um, African men, it's like I have to unpack that. I have to, uh, I have to unpack that. I have to deconstruct that. And, and I know that it's not all African men, but we got all, we got a, a lot of work to do internally with our people about how they put us against each other like that. Um, and what does that mean and what does that look like? So this whole show is making me process that thread a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and like, I'm like, was I antagonistic in that, <laughs> in that space? So I'm, like, so I'm thinking about like, how do I show up? And like, when's it the time to dialogue? And when's there a time to dialogue on, online and a time not to dialogue online when our people are being attacked, like when African women are being attacked. And so that, that's what I was thinking about, you know, during this, this discussion. I know exactly what thread you mean. I don't think you're being antagonistic. I remember being very frustrated. But then also, like I saw a lot of African men. So we're talking about the, the murder of Makia Bryant, who was a 15 year old African girl who called the police for help and then was shot basically on the fight and killed. And then in the aftermath of that, which happened the same day that the verdict in the George Floyd case came down, um, in the aftermath of that, you saw like a lot of African people blaming her for that outcome. It was, you know, it was a lot of African men, but it was, I thought African people of all genders being like, well, you know, just about shooting. And like, to me, when we're at the point when we're like, it is okay for this armed agent of the state to shoot this person without a trial. Like at the point where we're making excuses for like the violence of the colonial state as a colonized people, like that shows that we are incredibly lost in the sauce. That shows that we are an incredibly colonized and as a whole, very confused people. Because we are now, we have internalized the justification that this system uses to dehumanize us. And now we are repeating it to rationalize it's violence against us. So mm -hmm. like, there was a lot of things like going into that, like the fact that she was like a, a heavier, like she was, a, she was a heavier girl. And I feel like out the gate, people were like less sympathetic because people are fat phobic. I feel like the fact that she was a woman in general, the fact that um, she was a youth in foster care, like there were so many intersecting things um, mm -hmm. about this particular girl, this working class African girl that made people think that violence against her was justified. And so I feel like the issue is not African men specifically in that case, it's the fact that we are 
colonized and the fact that patriarchy is systemic and devalues like bigger um, African women and African girls that are poor and working class. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it does. And I definitely was not on social media that day um, or that even week often. Um, I was thinking about the thread that I was tagged in where it was um, more African men on that space. But you're right. You're completely right. It's just, it's colonization, yeah. you know, and it was sad. It was sad and it was frustrating to see, you know, our people um, blaming an African child who's 15 for her own murder. Um, and so I really appreciate, um, somebody wrote an article in Hood Communist, right, about the, uh, about it. And it was really, really good. Um, that really helped me to like reflect about, um, like you're just saying, the, man, we're programmed. <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta really, I just can't believe that. Like, are we, yeah. So working on it. And we got to like, we're going to struggle through it. We're going to struggle through it with our people. We're going to unlearn. We're going to learn together because we have to. Yeah. You have to bring, like, I really like when Erica said, like, I'm not just trying to organize people that think like, it's mm -hmm. just not going to work. If it's all people that agree with us, it's going to be a very small revolution. Like we got to like win people over and like bring them with us and help them understand that this system has no right whatsoever to take a single one of us, not a single one of us. I don't care. If that girl, first of all, she had a butter knife. I don't care if she had like a steak knife. They have no right to take a single one of our lives. Like, do y'all understand this? This system has no right whatsoever to take any single one of us for any reason. Like that is the point that people need to get to, to understand that they don't get to take one of ours. They just don't. The system was built on millions of our bodies. How can we justify another death? Like it makes no sense, regardless of the circumstances. I don't care. I don't care. That's where we all need to be at. Yes. All of like, no, like no police are going to kill any African for any reason. I don't care if they have a grenade, like a drone. I don't fucking care. Like y'all don't have the right. You do not have the right at this point to take a single one of ours for any reason. I don't care. There's no justified police shooting to me. People have no right. But yeah. Anyway. So thank you so much for uh, sticking through the PE section. Um, and the intro of the program, y'all had some great thoughts. You were really feeling Erica, which I do not blame y'all. Erica is brilliant. Um, also, folks, for giving some praise for Jamu. Sally Fu says, but Jamu is a, really, uh, is a real guiding light. So thankful for that, man. Me too. Me too. It changed my life. For the better. By recruiting me into this organization. So shout out to a Jamu. A uh, comrade on YouTube says, I support y'all queens. We support you too. Um, Sally Fu says, African people should not outsource the handling of conflict in our communities to our oppressors, period. Period. There's no reason whatsoever why police should be involved in any kind of interpersonal dispute in our communities because police kill people and get away with it. Why would we bring that into the situation? Like, we need to build institutions and structures for conflict resolution, for dealing with harm and abuse that do not involve a system built on our exploitation and agents of that system. Like we just need to get them out of the picture entirely, which is why we're all about revolutionary community defense, y'all. Um, cuckoo. Yeah, lots of praise for Ricky. Lots of people saying thank you. So thank you so much. So let's keep it moving so we can wrap this up. So we want to talk about what's going up, going on with the All African People's Revolutionary Party. First, let's talk about what we're doing here in Tiwa territory. Lots of cool stuff. The Pan-African Community Garden is continuing. The progress in just over a month is actually, quite frankly, incredible. It's incredible what we've done. So we have completed like one full side of the fence. So if you go by Avenida Cesar Chavez and Arno, you're going to see a legitimately nice, legitimately nice fence made of pallets that was constructed by members of the community um, for free, basically. Like we just bought like metal poles as like the internal structure and the rest of it is built with pallets that were donated and people who were donating their time with like drills and screws. So it's actually really incredible. And as you can see, I'm very like impressed by that fence. <laughs> like I can't get over how nice it is and how easy it was to do it. I can't get over it. Um, but we also have planted many, many plants. We got a bed full of tomatoes. We're gonna have to do like a spaghetti dinner or something because if those tomatoes all live, it's gonna be like a lot of, a lot of tomatoes. 
Like, got, like tomatoes you grow are like so incredible. They're so much better than supermarket tomatoes. So I'm excited. Um, we have a bed full of peppers. We put in corn and collard greens last weekend. Um, and we're gonna have another work day. Oh yeah, and we also, we don't have running water on the lot yet. So we're basically running this garden without a water source on site. We have a full schedule of volunteers who show up every day to refill our Oyas. Oyas are an actual African, like an ancient African form of irrigation where you bury, uh, bury like a terracotta jar up to the neck and you fill it with water. And then the water like goes through the pores of the jar directly to the roots of the plant and keeps it moisturized without wasting any water. Um, so they're actually working really well. The plants are still alive. <laughs> and so it's really awesome. We put down a layer of mulch um, last Sunday to keep the, uh, the soil even more moist and to like conserve as much water as possible. So, so far the oils are working out. We do anticipate when it gets like peak Southwest summer that we are probably gonna have to water more times a day. And we're hoping the, the water will be installed by them, by the water authority, but we're gonna see. But so far, Oyas are working great. This coming Sunday, we're gonna have another build day starting at 2 p.m. at the garden. We wanna build some benches because now we got the fence completed. We got like a little enclosed area. And so now we wanna have like a community space, a place where people can gather, sit, can rest and talk. They're gonna be building some benches out of pallets because we still have like 30 pallets. And we are also going to be building a compost bin out of pallets. And we're gonna be composting some goat manure. Yes, goat manure that was donated to us by a local farm. So that's coming up on this coming Sunday, 2 p.m. at the garden, two to four. And we're also gonna be doing for the political education topic that day, building revolutionary institutions. So the Pan-African Community Garden is a revolutionary institution. The School of African Roots, the APRP started in Oregon, is a community institution. The breakfast program that we did and the Black Panther Party did is a community institution. We're gonna be talking about how you build things like that. Like what are the steps? What does it take? What kind of resources do you need? Less than you think. All that coming on Sunday um, at the Build Day at the Garden, so please join us. Also, we are still doing our elder care program. We do deliveries of groceries and masks and political education and cleaning supplies to elders in Tiwa territory every single Saturday afternoon. We've been doing it for over a year, every single Saturday. And so that is continuing. If you know an elder that would benefit from such a program because it is still a pandemic, it is still a pandemic, the people in charge are acting like it's over, but people are still getting sick and dying. And increasingly those people are African and indigenous and Chicano, there is a massive gap in vaccines. And in that gap, we are seeing that the suffering once again falls to the most oppressed people, our people. So the pandemic is still not over. We're gonna continue that program. If you know an elder that would need that program, give us a call or a text at 505-295-0008 or email us at apipnewmexico at gmail.com and we will put them on our delivery. Also, the next Pan-African film series, we do the film series on the second Saturday of each month. The second Saturday of June is next Saturday, June 12th. And we are showing perhaps the best movie ever made, y'all. Ever. <laughs> ever. And I do not say that lightly. It is the best movie. We are showing the spook who sat by the door. Oh my God, it's so good. And I love showing it to new people. It is the fictional story of the very first African to be hired by the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, or the Criminals in Action, if we like to call them in APRP. And rather than selling out like Kamala Harris and Barack Obama, instead, he uses the skills that he learns in the CIA to help organize an African revolution in an urban neighborhood, y'all. It is amazing. It is amazing. It is a very good social commentary on class contradictions within the African community, on why we have to understand our struggle as an anti-colonial revolutionary struggle, on why attempting to assimilate into capitalism, into U.S. imperialism is a mistake and why it's never going to work out for us. It's also very funny and a legitimately good action movie. So if you want to watch the spook who sat by the door with us, tune in on our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube pages. Next Saturday, June 12th at 2 p.m. Mountain Time, we're going to show the film. We're going to talk about it as usual. Join us. And then lastly, here in Tiwa Territory, we have begun organizing for Fourth of the Lie. Fourth of the Lie is an anti-American nationalist alternative to Fourth of July. 
We know in July 4th, 1776, African people were still enslaved. Indigenous people were getting their land stolen. Like, we were not free on this land when America uh, celebrated its first Independence Day. We're actually still not free on this land. And so what business would we possibly have celebrating Independence Day on July 4th? It's not our Independence Day. No, it is 4th of the lie. And so we want to mainstream anti-American nationalism. We want to create an accessible and fun community space. We're going to have nanas and babies, kids, and the homies all come to the park, uh, burn a flag with us, and listen to revolutionary anti-imperialist speakers talking about why we need to reject the U.S. empire. It's going to be a really great day. We're planning to have food. We're planning to have child care, the aforementioned flag burning, um, all kinds of really great things in a park in Tiwa territory. Stay tuned for more details. That is happening Sunday, July 4th. Um, also, HPP International has quite a bit going on. We had African Liberation Day last week. Um, so we had the Azania virtual presentation, the DMB or Maryland virtual presentation, and then the international webinar all last week, which you can view on the HPP International YouTube channel. Please do. Also, we at Weekly Pan African News are one of several All African People's Revolutionary Party produced podcasts. Like we are one of five, actually, five total podcasts produced by members of the APRP. Which First up, we have the Pantsula podcast Mondays at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, which is released by the KG Work Study Circle of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Most of the members of that circle are in New York and the United States. But they do a podcast every single Monday. It's called the Pantsula Podcast. It is quite good. The last episode was my comrade Jamila, my former Oregon chapter comrade Jamila, now in New York, talking to our comrade Tiernan, who is a revolutionary Asian comrade who has fought side by side on the front lines uh, against fascists and white nationalists and all kinds of things. Like Tiernan is a ride or die comrade, y'all. Tiernan is also Filipino. So Tiernan and Jamila are talking about uh, African and Asian solidarity, the truth about it, the history of it, and why our struggles are connected. So tune in to that on the Kaji YouTube channel. Also, Comrade Ajamu, who we have big up on this show <laughs> for like the last hour because he's awesome, has a weekly show with his daughter Shakura every single Sunday at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. They do a political education topic um, on a diff from a revolutionary African perspective. I do not know what the topic this Sunday is, I apologize. But I guarantee you, you're going to learn a lot. I guarantee you, he's going to be hilarious. I guarantee you, Shakur is going to come with the heat. So please tune into that Sundays at 5 p.m. Mountain Time on Ajamu's Facebook page, Ajamu Umi. And also, you can watch it live on APRP International YouTube channel now. So Sundays at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. Also, our comrade in Missouri, who we had on the show about two weeks ago, who everybody fell in love with because she is incredible, um, has her own podcast, the Revolutionary African Woman Podcast, with our comrade Holly Matu, who I believe is in Germany right now. Um, so they have their Facebook page, Revolutionary African Women. They publish the podcast on one Saturday each month, and you can view the past episodes on the Revolutionary African Women Facebook page. And lastly, members of the APRP's social media task force who have revolutionized the APRP's social media presence have their own podcast, the Forward Ever Podcast, which you can listen to. Spotify, and Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcast. But it's, again, from a revolutionary Pan-African perspective, this time's coming from the youth, and I highly recommend it. Like, five different APRP podcasts. We have coverage of, like, almost every day of the week. Y'all could be listening to the APRP talk about Pan-Africanism every single day if you want to, and you should. But this has been Weekly Pan-African News. My name is Onyesanmu. This is my comrade, Monika. We are both members of the All African People's Revolutionary Party New Mexico chapter. We do this show every single Thursday at 12 p.m. Mountain Time, which means we're going to be back next week with another interview. We're hoping to have an interview with another cadre of the APRP so you can learn more about us. Also, as Erica mentioned, today is Thursday, which means there's new articles on hoodcommunist.org. New blog posts on hoodcommunist.org. Please check those out. Please read them and share them. Whoopsies, I'm trying to link to Hood Communist. I was posting about the car camera. One second. So, yep, check out all the new writing on hoodcommunist.org. New posts every single Thursday. Read those posts and share those posts, especially if you are interested in amplifying the voices of revolutionary African women and revolutionary African marginalized genders who are calling out these sellouts. 
who are calling out identity reductionism. We have so much good content on Hood Communist about exactly that subject. Eric, I went deep into so please check it out, hoodcommunist.org. If you hear have your prayer watching this program, if you can hear me speak, you're not active in an organization fighting for justice, I need you join an organization fighting for justice, y'all. Join an organization fighting for justice. Get off the sidelines. Get into a fight. Learn how to build collectively with people to transform the material conditions of your people. Learn how to struggle, develop your revolutionary consciousness, and contribute to something larger than yourself. If no organization exists that you like, if no organization exists that you believe in, then start an organization of your own. Start an organization. All you need is a few friends and a book, and you're already on your way, y'all. Schedule a meeting, assign roles, develop a schedule for when you meet, and start getting to work. An organization doesn't have to have any specific structure. Any collective of people unified under one strategy, moving towards uh, shared goals, is an organization. It can look a lot of different ways, but point blank period, we need folks organized. We need folks working collectively with each other to transform this world. So thank y'all so much for joining us. This has been Weekly Pan-African News. Stay tuned for some music and some flyers for upcoming APFP events. Have a good day. Let's go.